Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the quarterly meeting of the Denver Conservation Group. My name is Julie Mock. I'm the Conservation Director for the Colorado Mountain Club. Um, and we are excited to have a guest speaker tonight um, from Protect Our Winners to talk a little bit about um, advocacy in relation to climate change and, and outdoor spaces. Um, we're also going to have some time to hear from our state staff about conservation updates, as well as our Denver group liaison um, uh, and to talk about the various projects that they, they are working on. Um, so excited to have you here tonight. Um, just to, as a reminder for folks on Zoom, if you can mute yourself when you're not speaking, um, that'll just help keep the audio clean. We are recording this and we'll put it out on YouTube for anybody who couldn't attend tonight. Um, Steve, anything to add before we kick it over to Ben? Nope. Uh, more power to you. Get it going. All right. Great. Well, I'm really excited to introduce Ben from Protect Our Winners. I'm not going to do a full intro because I'm sure you can speak to his background and experience better than I can. Um, but Ben, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Sure. Appreciate it. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Julie and Steve and the whole team here. Wonderful to be with everyone. Uh, I've been following the organization um, for quite some time. And I believe my dad was a member when I was growing up for a really long time. So big fan of all the work that you all do and happy to join you all tonight and share a little bit about what we're up to at POW. Um, and I'm going to attempt to share my screen here um, and see how this works um, and do a, a little presentation. Let me just go to presenter mode here. Just a quick second. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, looks great. Okay, cool. So as, uh, as Julie mentioned, uh, my name is Ben Gubitz. I'm from the organization called Protect Our Winters. I'm the director of campaigns and advocacy, um, which means I handle uh, much of the work that comes through the door around advocacy, both on legislative work, on policy, on uh, our electoral campaigns, on the C4 side of our work, as we're uh, dipping into the midterm season here pretty soon. So much of the kind of political work um, kind of comes through my shop over here at POW. I'm relatively new to POW. I started in May. Um, but before that, I um, spent much of uh, the better part of the last decade working on democracy issues, um, mostly money and politics, um, gerrymandering, voting rights, those sorts of issues I first started doing. Um, uh, this democracy work because I was so concerned about climate. I saw the direct connection between the undue influence of money in our political system and the inability to uh, seriously pass um, meaningful climate legislation. So started working on some of those foundational issues. Um, as we know, in the post Citizens United world, uh, where wealthy individuals and large corporations um, can spend an unlimited amount of money in political campaigns and therefore are subject, uh, our elected officials are subject to um, influence from most of those folks. And certainly the fossil fuel industry has had a tremendous and outsized influence um, in, our political, uh, in our political sphere. And so started to become really interested in the root causes of, of why there was such inertia um, at the congressional level, as well as the state and local level, and, and, and the ability to act meaning, meaningful uh, legislation on climate. And so um, I had founded an organization called American Promise that was dedicated to a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United in related cases, um, to overturn that doctrine that money is the same as speech and that corporations have the same constitutional rights as human beings do. Again, both of those kind of tenets in Citizens United has really led to, um, you know, this uh, this you know assault on our on our planet and 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 any effort to to keep it healthy. So, um, for the better part of the last decade, working on those types of issues um, because of climate, and then um, once I um, had young children, I really started to dip more into the climate space um, and just doing everything that I can to, to protect the planet for that generation and beyond. And so I'm super happy to be at POW and happy to answer any other questions about my background. 
um, later on in the uh, later on in the presentation. So, um, so our strategic objectives at PAL, um, we went through a pretty long process this year in uh, figuring out an, a new strategic plan for the organization from now through 2024. And so it basically boils down to three strategic objectives, what we're doing at PAL. We want to um, grow our reach in what we call the outdoor state. The outdoor state is what we call the 50 million Americans um, that uh, are active in the outdoors. There's about 50 million, give or take, um, that participate in outdoor recreation. Um, we call them the outdoor state and hope to mobilize that outdoor state into an influential uh, advocacy and voting block um, moving forward that, that will vote uh, with climate and conservation um, at the top of their mind as they head to the voting booths. Um, to do that, we're gonna, uh, as, as many folks know, at Protect Our Winters, we have a whole network of Alliance ambassadors. These are professional athletes from Olympians to professional climbers and skiers and snowboarders um, to uh, professional rock climbers across the board. Um, and we have uh, a creative alliance. These are filmmakers that make outdoor adventure films. And then we have, of course, our Science Alliance, um, who are just absolutely, um, you know, critical as we learn about the science of climate change and global warming and the impact that it has on the outdoor sports community. Uh, as we all know, with, uh, with, with shrinking snowpack in the winter, uh, leading to uh, less runoff for our rivers, um, and uh, the the drought and heat uh, and wildfires all are impacting the $887 billion outdoor economic uh, or outdoor industry. And so we uh, so train and support these Alliance members to um, spread messaging on climate um, through their in kind of influencer channels and then um, mobilize them for climate wins. We just wrapped up our fall lobby day two weeks ago where we had all of our Alliance members or many of our Alliance members meeting with members of Congress um, to consider and advocate for sensible climate legislation, which I'm gonna get into a little bit later. So those are the kind of three strategic objectives in terms of what we are doing over at Protect Our Winters. Um, you know, we connect with and support bunches of athletes. We have partners for resorts. Um, we have many brand partners, including, you know, Burton and Patagonia and, uh, you know, North Face and other very large outdoor brands that we uh, lean on for partnership, um, creatives, scientists and members. So all of these folks together really make up what we call the outdoor state. Um, and it's a very powerful uh, driver for change once you think about the, the impact that the, these 50 million people can have and this $887 billion industry. Um, we have uh, a strong commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, the, from our view, the outdoor state is diverse. Um, we look to make it more diverse as typically outdoor recreation, uh, at least in America, has been reserved for those who just can't afford it. And so we have a strong uh, commitment to include DEI in all of the work that we do. Um, because we all have a deep connection to the land and it's on all of us uh, to do what we can to protect it. Um, so we're diversifying our Alliance members, our partners, our board and staff, et cetera. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about current campaigns that we're doing with you all tonight. Um, and again, I'm happy to answer any questions as soon as I wrap up here. We currently have um, four ongoing campaigns. Um, that's federal climate legislation that's moving through con Congress, um, really going deep on this issue of climate finance, which may be new to some of you all. That's the connection between um, uh, our warming planet and the financial system, um, protecting public lands. And of course, as we get into midterm season, getting out the vote to elect climate champions up and down the ballot. Um, Right now, there's uh, the federal climate infrastructure package, which is broken up into two uh, very large bills, which I'm sure you've all seen on the news. It's kind of hard to uh, escape, but it is, if passed, would be the largest investment in climate in, in, in the history. Uh, it's also um, the largest spending package in American history as well. Um, and so 
There are two, there are uh, um, essentially, uh, and I'll go back to this slide, essentially two bills. There's the bipartisan infrastructure framework bill that passed uh, the Senate and is currently before the House. And then there's the reconciliation, the larger package that's three and a half trillion dollars in spending for social programs, including climate that's that passed the House and is currently before the Senate. We know that negotiations continue on both of those. And so POW is pretty deep uh, into those negotiations, working with lawmakers to make sure that uh, climate provisions stay within both of those bills. This is the best opportunity we've had to pass any climate legislation since 2009, um, and probably the best chance uh, we'll have for uh, time to come. So we're really all in on, on this, uh, this, this infrastructure framework. And so um, we're really focusing on four you know, key areas um, within these two bills for policy buckets. Um, we're fighting for uh, clean energy tax rebates and eliminating fossil fuel incentives. The federal government incentivizes fossil fuel companies to the tunes of billions of dollars annually. We'd like to see that money um, go towards renewables and not towards uh, superheating and melting the planet. Um, we also uh, are very interested in the build out of electric vehicles and transportation solutions. So these, the idea is to make electric vehicles more affordable for the average American consumer built here um, and uh, the large build out of EV charging infrastructure to make sure that folks can actually get from point A to point B. Um, as we know, the transportation sec section or sector is responsible for a very large part of our emissions um, in this country. And so electrifying transit is uh, very high on our list. Um, and I, I guess I should have mentioned um, <clears throat> for Protect Our Winters in terms of policy, we specifically engage in climate mitigation work, not adaptation, not conservation, um, you know, while we're extremely supportive of of climate adaptation thing um you know policy as well as conservation our lane is really in this how do we mitigate the most disastrous uh, effects of climate change um these policies speak to that the next thing is that we're really focusing on is updating the electric grid our grid uh was uh, has been about a hundred years old and in order to pump renewable energy in uh, into the grid, we need to basically lay tens of thousands of miles of new transmission lines, replace substations, et cetera, to get to uh, net zero uh, electricity by 2050, which is the goal, which was President Biden's goal. Um, in order to meet that goal, we need to uh, focus on updating the grid. Um, and then uh, supporting worker transition, folks, fo folks in fossil fuel com communities that uh, will find themselves in tr transition. We need to make sure that we're um, ensuring a just, a just transition for these folks uh, that are reliant on fossil fuel jobs. Um, that includes um, putting folks to work, laying those tens of thousands of miles of transmission lines capping orphan oil and gas wells and mines, et cetera. There's plenty of work out there to be done. So those are really the four big policy solutions that we're working on in this campaign. I talked a little bit about the two legislative pathways. It's the bipartisan infrastructure package and budget reconciliation. Again, uh, I'm sure you guys know all about this. It's been all over the news, um, but happy to answer more questions on that. I'm trying to uh, keep things moving along here so that I don't run out of time. So some of the things that we do that, that I think is pretty interesting and a little bit different um, from a lot of organizations is we really lean on our kind of unique superpower to mobilize influencers. Just this past, um, a, a few weeks ago, we got uh, Tommy Caldwell, who most, on the, most folks on the call will know is a world famous climber, arguably one of the most famous climbers in the world uh, to get Senator John Hickenlooper up uh, up on the crag with him um, and spent the day talking about climate, talking about these policies within infrastructure. So it really is kind of like taking lobbying to a, a whole new lev level when we're asking elected officials to actually go outside with some of our athletes and influencers and, 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 and take a step back from their day to day in Washington, look at the land and think about some of these issues as it impacts us um, in the outdoor sports community. 
a lot of folks, um, senators and staff alike, don't really have an opportunity to get outside of their little DC bubble. So we really try to do as much as we can in getting elected officials outside with some of our folks, whether it's skiing or climbing or just taking a hike in the woods or just having a beer by the river. The more folks we think that can be outside um, and appreciate the natural world, the more likely they are to fight for it. Um, so that's some of the work that we're doing there on infrastructure. Um, Another campaign that we're very excited about is this uh, this uh, this idea of climate finance. So a lot of folks don't really recognize the connection between our financial system and climate. Um, when we make deposits into the bank or investments, um, that money obviously doesn't just sit there. It goes out into the world to finance things, some of them good things, a lot of them bad things. So we're working with large outdoor brands um, to either have them put pressure on their bank to divest from fossil fuels um, or to switch banks altogether to more, uh, you know, green alternative banking solutions and really helping them kind of green their financial supply chain. Um, the other thing that we're doing is uh, putting pressure on the Fed to prioritize climate and monetary policy. So um, as part of that, we partnered with uh, Green Alpha Advisors and Bank of the West and Conservation Alliance and Atmos and Amalgamated Bank um, and training CFOs and CEOs of large outdoor brands in um, helping them understand the impact that their money might be having on the world. I think a lot of times outdoor brands um, will claim they're uh, at net zero um, through their supply chains without really considering their financial supply chains. And if you look at what their money is doing, they're actually very far from net zero. And it's one of the most important levers that we can pull. Um, this next uh, thing, this is um, our one of our campaigns to put pressure on the Fed called the Stop the Money Pipeline. Um, where we sent these folks up to the top of Tiwanak Mountain in the Grand Tetons uh, to hang the banner during the uh, Jackson Hole Economic Symposium, where kind of the who's who of bankers and policymakers were. And um, this video is like five minutes long, so I think I may skip that one, even though it's really cool. What do you think, Julie? Should I play it or should I skip it? How am I doing on time? Uh, we're... Maybe a little tight on time if there's another video, but maybe we can get the links um, to both of these. I'll do the I'll do the links. This is yeah, yeah. I'll do the links. Um, but I'll just explain just one more minute about it. So, the Jackson Hole Economic uh, Economic Symposium every year, which is in Jackson Hole, brings um, you know monetary policymakers, lawmakers, bankers, et cetera, from all over the world to determine what our monetary policy is, and we wanted to draw attention to climate. And so, right outside of the Jackson Hole. Uh, Lodge is, is a, a view of Tiwanak Mountain. So we sent Zahan Villamoria and a few of our uh, other Athlete Alliance climbers to get up there and, and hang this banner and, and draw attention um, to the issue of climate finance is a great project. Um, okay, so that is um, uh, climate finance doing a lot of really interesting work there. And then we continue to do work on protecting public lands. Julie and I were just talking about this right before we got started. Um, public lands, folks don't uh, maybe not really recognize, but if public lands were its own country, it would rank, rank fifth in the world for emissions. Um, 25, um, well, this is a little bit outdated, but 20, almost 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from public lands. And so we would really like to see our public lands be more part of the solution than the problem, including um, you know, renewables, solar and wind, et cetera. It's really an astounding fact when you think about it, China, United States, India, Russia, and then US public lands in terms of the emissions. Um, uh, you know, there is significant extraction that happens on public lands, which is not only bad for access and wildlife, et cetera, but just really bad to contribute into uh, the warming planet. Um, so that's another campaign that we're doing. And then, of course, on our action fund side um, and, and of going into 2022, uh, we'll be spearheading a big electoral campaign to get out the votes to elect climate champions up and down the ticket. We do have priority geographies for this work. It's Colorado, Montana, Arizona, Utah, Nevada um, for the next several years. And we'd really up, like to elect as many climate champions as possible um, and get as many 
as much power out of the hands of Joe Manchin as possible, as uh, we all know that he is standing in the way of, of much of this progress. So we have a big GOTV campaign, um, and here's a cool video describing some of that work. If we want to protect the places we love, we must vote. But first, let's start at the beginning. Here, 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 and here. Our country claims to be built on a lot of things. Ideals, law, truth. But the one thing that's perfect, what America's actually built on, is the land. This land. This land. This land. This land. For some of us, our ancestors have been here forever. Others arrived centuries ago. Others did not choose to come here at all. And others were simply our parents looking to give us new opportunities. But despite our different paths, we all converged here on this land, not made for you or for me, but for everyone. You see, the land is our common ground. The mountains, the slopes, the forests, the crags, and the coasts. The places we play and the places we escape to. We cannot continue to allow our seasons to shrink, our rivers to be polluted, our skies to warm, and our forests to burn. So we must rally around the other thing that unites us, our right to vote. Because no matter who you are, if you love the land, you are a member of the outdoor state. 50 million people strong, not defined by borders or party lines, but by the passion for places we love, bigger than any other state, more powerful to it, but only if we vote. So let's stand for our common ground, whether our common ground looks like this, or this, or this. If you love the land, it's time to make a plan to vote. Make your plan to vote at makeadamplan.org. So it's a cool video. And um, what I love about this video is it's called Common Ground at POW. We really do believe that, that the land is our common ground and the love for the land is our common ground. And that can really transcend uh, a lot of the partisan divisions that we have right now. Uh, Protect Our Winters is fiercely uh, cross-partisan and nonpartisan, and we're happy to um, support and encourage support for candidates on all sides of the aisle, Republican, Democratic, or independent, as long as, uh, as, long as you support um, sensible climate movement. Um, so uh, very excited about some of the electoral work that we'll be doing in Colorado and other places in the, in the next coming um, year. And um, I think for some reason my slides are, uh, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, in the next coming year, and I, I really do think that, you know, with, you know, such a powerful voting block of folks that, you know, love the outdoor places and try to protect them, that we can really have uh, a huge impact in some of these elections, both at the local, state, and federal level. So I'm very excited about uh, the midterms coming up in 2022. I'm optimistic. Um, that they will go well uh, in electing climate champions and encourage all to uh, participate and, and, of course, make your plan to vote um, next year. But um, I know that we're just probably running out of time now, and so I would be happy to uh, open it up to questions, and I'll stop sharing my screen here so I can see all of your lovely faces. Hello to all. Great. Feel free to fire Thanks, away any questions. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, feel free to take yourself on, off of mute, um, turn your camera on um, and go ahead and, and jump in with questions. There, I think are a few of us that we won't be talking over each other too much. Yeah, Ju Julie, I have one comment for Ben. I'm also on the board of directors of a center-right organization called Conservatives for Responsible Stewardship. It's been doing a lot of climate work and renewable energy work the last couple of years in uh, Nevada, Arizona, and Florida. And uh, next couple of days, I'd like to do an email introduction for you with our president uh, who is in the Metro DC area. And that group is also a 501c3. So it's uh, not going to be endorsing candidates, but there might be some common ground uh, between uh, the two organizations. So. I'll do that uh, for you in the next couple of days. 
I really appreciate that. I mean, we um, really are deliberate in our attempts to be as cross-partisan as possible. I don't say bipartisan because actually the majority of outdoor enthusiasts are actually independents. Um, so I think bipartisan is a little bit of a slight to those folks, but um, uh, Steve, I would really appreciate that. Any any help that you, that we can get in, in reaching out to the conservative audience and, and helping them, um, you know, come along the path to, to uh, fighting for climate change solutions would be great. Thanks, Steve. We've actually had fairly good success in selling it to Republican groups, uh, even on right-wing radio in Florida. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's a state that's the highest natural point is 345 feet above sea level. Sure. So they have reason to be concerned about climate. Without question, without question. But so do the so do the, you know, hunters in Wisconsin or the farmers in Michigan or, you know, there, I mean, there is no, no matter what or, you know, what, what you do or where you are, it is impacting you in some way, shape or form. So thank you. Thank you for that, Steve. Other questions from folks? I have a couple of questions, but I want to make sure other people have a chance. <laughs> uh, I have one more question, Julie. Why don't you go first? And I'll mute for a couple minutes. Sounds good. Ben, I was just going to ask if you can expand a little bit on your, your public lands work and, and what you all are doing in that space. You mentioned that um, a huge you know percentage, percentage of our emissions is coming from public lands. And can you talk about, are you working on 30 by 30 or some other um, campaigns related to public lands? The core act um, for sure for public lands, 30 by 30, we haven't dug in as much. Um, there's a, it's more centered on um, conservation, but um, you know, in terms of public lands campaigns right now, it's just, it's just the core act. Um, by the time infrastructure and reconciliation wraps up, we're going to see what's still left on the table and gear up for some more public lands fights, but that specifically relate to reducing emissions on public lands. Gotcha. Great. Thanks. Steve, you want to jump in? Uh, Ben, do you, do you get into any of the, uh, stuff involving the energy industry that as a conservative, I would consider bad business practices, like sitting on a, over a half million acres of undeveloped leases in the Western US, special treatment like the oil depletion allowance that energy companies get. Is this something that's on your radar or is it for whatever reason you aren't touching it right now? Um, I mean, it's, it's on the radar, radar as it relates to what's in those two spending packages, right? And so we are very much interested in energy policy around electric grid transmission, right? I think that we know that, uh, that the coal-fired power plants are outdated as we saw what happened in Texas, you know, last winter, they're not, they're ill prepared to handle a changing climate. So making sure that we have an updated electric grid to actually be able to deliver power to its customers, but to do so um, in a way using renewable energy sources. And so most of our uh, focus on energy right now is about the electric grid and things like the Clean Electric Performance Program, um, which would, if implemented, get us to carbon-free electricity completely by 2050. Um, so that's really where uh, most of our focus is on energy. And in case you weren't aware, the Protecting America's Wilderness Act, which I believe does include the CORE Act, is currently attached to the National Defense Appropriations Act coming out of the House. And it's correct. Don't know what's going to happen to it in the Senate or if it goes to conference committee. So, but anyway. Yeah, that was great. We, that was welcome news. We were happy to see that. We'll see, uh, we'll see what happens in the Senate. They have, um, they have a lot on their plate to say the least. Is it, I mean, 2050, I think is like by that time, you know, there won't be a planet. Like what's the point of 2050? I mean, I realize sorry, that the, politically, politically, maybe you can't do 2040, but 2050 to me is ridiculous. 
Like there, there's, you know, the CO2 in the ocean is already almost at the tipping point. So yeah, you mean you know, for carbon? 2050 car sounds like, you know, that's what we hear from, uh, from Xcel Energy here in Denver. You know why they they keep this coal fired plant and we, you know the, and the ratepayers have to pay for it. And like twenty fifty is meaningless. Well, I mean, to, so to think about completely overhauling our entire electric grid all across the country, it's going to take a very long time with a lot of investments um, to be made by the federal government and public private private partnerships. Um, the IPCC report it was alarming in that some of those greenhouse uh, gas reduction targets um, should be on a faster timeline. Um, I agree that 2050 does seem like a little ways out, but to be realistic, to get 100% carbon-free electricity, um, that's uh, just where we're at. You know, to, if, if, if there is new technology, including nuclear or other technologies that's more advanced that come up that can, that can get us there faster, well, then that's where we're at. But to think about it, you know, to this, you know, if, if the CEPP uh, passed, it would get us to 50% complete carbon-free electricity by 2035. Again, this is a huge step and that's a massive, massive reduction in emissions. And that's, and that's just for the electric grid. That's not including the building uh, the building sector, the transportation sector, et cetera. So we, I think we can't even cap methane, you know, leaking wells in Colorado. So I, I my fear is, I guess, if I hear 2050, that nobody's going to think they need to do anything in 2020. No, because I think it's, I think it's understood that all of that work needs to start now urgently in order to make it to the, in order to reach those targets by that time, this is when we have to start now. Right. And so it's, it's not it's not waiting till 2050 to get started. It's starting now. And it takes that much time to completely overhaul overhaul our electric grid system, you know, completely rebuilding electric grid substations, the transmission lines, et cetera. I mean, it's a massive, massive project um, to completely overhaul the entire American energy system. And the other thing that I'll just add there as well is um, it, while it would be great to just flip a switch and go to renewables, um, the current grid does not have the capability to take on new power from renewables. So you have to build out new things and then, or you know, new ways to, to transmit that power. Um, and we have to start again, we have to start somewhere and it has to start now and we have to be realistic. And, you know, you can't just flip a switch because many of, uh, you know, consumers rely on electricity for their heat and other things and you can't just shut it down especially during you know cold winter seasons I, so. okay I, I agree i just think the 2050 is by that time we're in such deep it's almost meaningless yeah I'm an old person you know <laughs> yeah i well i i hope i hope that it's meaningful um but i think it's also i think it's also helpful to be realistic about what our timelines are Thanks, Ben. I'd, sure. like, I'd oh, like to gosh, just say one thing real quick. I'd like to think that, <laughs> well, I don't have any kids, but I have a niece who's like my most favorite person on this planet that she'll benefit from the work we're doing now. I mean, that's the only thing that you can, for me, keeps me going. Otherwise, I might as well, you know, smoke them while I got them. So, <laughs> just, uh... totally. No, that's right, Shannon. That's for me as well. I have a, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, and I want to be able to tell them that I did everything that I could possibly in my power to make sure that they had a healthy planet to grow up on, um, just like I did. And so um, for uh, for their kids as well, it's I'm less concerned about my kids' generation and more concerned about their kids' generation. Um, but, you know, I really do uh, believe that if we, you know, do absolutely everything that we can now, act with urgency, create the political will to create the change, then then I think that we can um, affect the change that we need to to have a healthy and sustainable planet for that younger generation. 
Then I have a high level question. Um, in my experience, POW is great at marketing and, and kind of communicating this message about climate or about conservation to you know, recreation users and getting people really excited about it. What are some of, and I know it's probably hard to pinpoint, um, but if you know we're, uh, the folks here in this room are going to be communicating out to our CMC membership and to other folks that we recreate with. What messages have been sort of most impactful or, or resonate, you know, kind of the most with the recreation community that you've seen? Yeah, we actually did a huge study on this, as we call it internally as the Neiman report, um, that is uh, that is all about messaging and connecting with the outdoor recreation community. And I'm happy to send that around. It's like a 30 page report on, um, you know, do's and don'ts and buzzwords and, you know, who are trusted, you know, messengers, that sort of thing. It really all comes down to discipline on messaging. Um, it comes down to who the messenger is, being authentic and telling stories with original content. Um, Pal's done a great job at really uh, pushing out and producing original and compelling content through our Athlete and Alliance channels. And the reason why um, it's marketed so well is um, it's this incredible network of folks that are able to, to create this content and, and push it out. But it really is about authentic storytelling you know, the, the highest return that we get on content is about connecting people and the place and the land, right? This is how climate change is impacting me and my profession or my sport or my industry um, and creating content co connecting place with people has been the highest return on any content that we push out and to be able to tell those stories authentically really connects with, with the audience that we're trying to go after. Awesome. That's super helpful. Yeah. And I'll send around that report as well. It's fascinating. Awesome. That would be great. Sure. Cool. Any other questions for Ben? If not, really appreciate uh, you guys having me on here this evening. It's wonderful to meet all of you. And Julie, feel free to uh, share my contact information around with folks if anyone wants to reach out for for more information or just to have a chat, always happy to connect with folks. So um, appreciate everyone taking the time and, and all the work that you all do um, and getting people outdoors and, and, and helping protecting the places that we love. So wonderful to be with you all. Great, thanks Ben. And if you can send me the links to those videos, um, then I can include them in, the, um, in the, this video when we post it online. Of course, happy to do so. Okay. Yeah, Ben, before you take off, I had to go out to the garage to the recycle stack. Are you familiar with The Economist magazine? Of course. Uh, did you see their current issue cover story, The Energy Shock? I have not. Uh, that would be worth picking up. I don't know if you can get it online. I mean, being British, they're in it for the money too. And uh, I am a subscriber I, to The Economist, so I should. Oh, you are? Okay, then yeah. you have seen this then. I haven't, but I haven't, um, but I will go check it out for sure. Okay, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a well-researched article in their typical way. And uh, the reason I said there, you may not be able to get it online because it's usually behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. Got it. Remind me the, remind me the, the is, is it the, the current issue? It's the October 16th to 22nd issue. So okay. that's the current one right now. There should be another, the next one coming out uh, this weekend. That sounds great. Thanks for the heads up, Steve. I'll definitely go check it out. Cool. All right. Well, wonderful to meet you all. I hope you have a great rest of your meeting and a lovely evening and feel free to reach out anytime with other questions. Thank you, Ben. We'll be in touch. Yeah, thanks again. Great. Um, well, thanks, everybody. I think uh, we'll transition into doing some quick, pretty quick updates um, from the state uh, conservation staff. And then, um, yeah, Steve, I'll let you run kind of the Denver group updates. Um, but actually, I'll kick it over to Kendall. And for those, um, this might be Kendall's first Denver group conservation meeting. I can't remember. If folks have not met her yet, she is our new conservation coordinator. Um, she's based up in Lafayette at the moment, but working across the state on both advocacy and stewardship projects, as well as our RIMS program. Um, so Kendall, you want to um, 
take it away with a couple of updates. And yeah, we are gonna keep recording so that we can make these available for folks too. Great, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Julie. I've met a couple of you. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, I'm happy to meet you tonight. Uh, like Julie said, my name is Kendall. I've been with CMC since June and kind of dabble in pretty much everything CMC does. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to be here. If I, it is my first uh, Denver Group Conservation meeting. So thank you all for letting me be here. Um, so I'll just give us a quick little update with a few things that CMC is working on in stewardship advocacy, our RIMS program, um, starting with the RIMS update. For those of you who hopefully everyone's familiar with RIMS by now, Recreation Impact Monitoring System, our app. Uh, we currently have 1,044 users in that app and that system, and along with uh, 5,698 assessments collected so far, so 5,700. I probably should just round that up. Um, so somebody go out there and get me two more assessments, please. <laughs> we can call it good. Then in our advocacy, we have two action alerts currently live on the website. And once I get done talking, oh, Julie posted it in the chat. Perfect. Uh, you can go check those out. We have the Colorado Wilderness Act that you can take action and contact our Colorado state senators to try to nudge them in the right direction towards supporting and hopefully maybe even sponsoring that amendment to the NDAA in the Senate. Uh, we also have our GMUG comment period, and I believe Julie will talk more a little bit about the Grand Mesa, Uncompahgre, and Gunnison uh, National Forest planning process and how you can comment on that, but that is an action alert as well. And then finally, I just wanted to give an update on our stewardship crews. They will be wrapping up their season next week in the Gunnison Bureau of Land Management, um, doing some trail work. But so far this season, they have built, these are some pretty big numbers, so just hold on to your seats here, 63,000 feet of trail either built, maintained, or restored, 1,209 trees logged out of trails, which is a really big number. There's a big lowdown and fire event, and they worked um, up in northern Colorado, but clearing a lot of trails this season. Uh, they also built 315 erosion control structures, whether those are drains, rolling dips, etc. cetera. Um, 50 square feet of rock wall installed, 103 check steps involved, and then 130 miles of trail maintenance and construction. All of this done in just 2,900 hours of work. I say just 2,900, but that's a pretty big amount of trees. That's almost, if you divide it, almost half a tree per hour. So that's pretty good for <laughs> what they're doing. That's our updates and our stats so far this year. Awesome, thanks Kendall. Um, yeah, and just a, a couple other things to add to that. Kendall mentioned um, the GMUG forest plan revision. So the Gunnison, or sorry, Grand Mesa, Uncompahgre and Gunnison National Forest on the, the West Slope, um, pretty much everything from Cresta Butte to um, Ridgeway and Ure um, up to you know, Grand Junction and the Grand Mesa are included in this forest planning process. And this will kind of set the stage really for the next 20 to 30 years of decision making on the forest when it comes to where new trails might be constructed, where um, over snow vehicles and snowmobiles are going to be allowed in the future, where timber harvesting and other extraction may might take place. Um, that sort of thing. So it's a really important plan. It's pretty high level um, and it's a really big document, but they are accepting public comment on their draft plan currently. And this is a really important time to weigh in. They're gonna do one more big round of revisions before they get to the final plan. Um, so we've been working with Outdoor Alliance um, and a bunch of other recreation groups on the West Slope to put comments together. And we have an action alert, like Kendall mentioned, available on the website that has like key talking points um, for some of our main takeaways from the plan. So we've, we've put together some comments that you can kind of copy and paste and then add any you know, personal experience that you might have recreating on the GMUG. If you've been you know, in the wilderness areas there or in, in areas that are proposed for new wilderness, um, 
you might talk about what your experience was like, um, the, you know, maybe the solitude and remoteness and, and, and quiet nature that you were looking for when you were out hiking or climbing there. So um, yeah, take a look at the action alerts. Um, the link is in the, in the chat and we'll put that um, into the description for the video as well. Um, and you can check those out and comment. Those comments are due by November 12th. Um, so that deadline's coming up in a few weeks. Um, a few other just updates. Um, a lot of you have, have heard about the work we were doing at uh, the Decalibron Peaks this year regarding public access on the private lands there. And um, we were successful this summer in getting the peaks reopened, um, but they are still private lands and there are still concerns around liability from those landowners. So we're continuing to work with them, um, looking at you know, some potential legislative fixes and, and various uh, tactics to, to sort of um, really codify the, the access up there and, and make sure these liability issues are, are addressed moving forward. So um, that work is, is ongoing and we may be looking to folks in the future to help with supporting that, that project. Um, the other thing that I'll mention, and this I actually meant to, to ask Ben a little bit about this too, um, but we uh, are looking forward to having our Snow Ranger program um, back up and running again this winter. Um, we've hosted it the last two years on the URA district of the Uncompahgre National Forest um, down in the Ridgeway, URA kind of Red Mountain Pass area. Um, so we're hiring folks. They'll be starting sometime in December, early January. Um, and we actually, at the end of their season last year, did um, a quick video session. And the film that we put together about that program was just accepted uh, to be a part of the Backcountry Film Festival. So this is a, a nationwide film festival. So CMC and our Snow Ranger program is gonna be highlighted in screenings across the country. So we're really excited. We'll have a number of screenings in Colorado. Um, Kendall's working on setting up dates and venues for the Front Range. Um, so look for info um, probably in January in February, we'll have those screenings in Golden and, and Boulder and elsewhere across the front range. So um, yeah, I think those were the main updates that I had from the state level. Any questions for Kendall or I? Yeah, Julie, I have one question. You had asked for responses on your proposal for possible legislation on our amendment to the recreation area statute uh, mm -hmm. by the 15th. And mm -hmm. I actually sent you one uh, morning of the 16th, Saturday. Yep. And I am not sure where that was going because you had sent that to conservation at cmc.org and I didn't see the stakeholder group there. It's going to that whole stakeholder group, Steve. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, we've pulled together a bunch of um, private landowners as well as other conservation groups interested in this private land issue. So Steve, yeah, they were all blind copied on that. And I have been getting responses from folks. I talked with John Ryber, who's the owner of the Decalibron Peaks last week. And I'm waiting to hear back from Patrick Shilkin, who's another landowner in the area and also a lawyer. Um, so yeah, I'm waiting to hear from a couple more folks this week that that didn't quite make the deadline um but i'll be following up with that that group um hopefully by the end of this week one thing i would offer as a suggestion if uh he hasn't weighed in maybe reach out to jerry abood mm -hmm. because if we go to the capitol uh he's an expert down there and he can certainly coach us on the do's and the don'ts and while he's from the motorized community he's Kind of been a semi mentor for me down there at times uh, as to pitfalls to avoid and uh, how to properly work legislators so I, I think he can be a real good resource for this if he's willing to put out the energy so great yeah i can reach out to him individually to see if i can get some feedback from him thanks Steve. any other questions on state conservation activities Great, well then Steve, I'll kick it to you and um, yeah, let you work on, on Denver Group updates. Okay, thanks Julie and Kendall, thanks. Thank you for your input. Uh, for those who aren't aware, Kendall's been getting a baptism of fire in the last couple of months. We've been, we've been plugging her into a lot of places, not just Julie, but also me copying her on a lot of stuff that I do, not all of which is Denver related. Uh, we've got 
one of our, we have our council liaison online tonight, our liaison from Denver Group Council, Sandy. Uh, did you wanna add anything as to what's going on at council? As I know the transition meeting is next month. Um, we're gonna have three new council members. That's um, pretty much all I can say right now, but uh, thanks for asking, Steve. Well, one thing I would add too is that we will have two conservation advocates on council for sure, because Jim Guerra, who is our Douglas County person, Jim is going on council. That's true. And, and so actually we have two now, but Roger Wendell is going off, so. Right. And Shannon, would you or Candace want to say anything about Jeffco? Sure, I can go ahead because I don't know if Candace was prepared with anything, but um, she did attend our last uh, Jeffco open space meeting. And um, right off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what transpired, but I don't think it was anything too crazy. Um, I did follow up the other day with about Mount Morrison. You asked about Steve, and I need my readers for this one. I look at my notes. Hold on. Um, so they're going to uh, start at the top in 2022 and start uh, fixing up that trail for those that uh, love that trail. I've never hiked it before. So they're going to uh, do general trail improvement and uh, make the changes so that the trail's more sustainable and uh, plan staircase at the bottom. They have that contracted out potentially in 2023. So that's uh, pretty much from Jeffco. Their meeting, which would, be to, would have been tomorrow has been canceled for this month. So we'll pick it back up in December. Okay, that sounds good. And you said you've never done it. And I've done it a couple of times. I didn't like the downhill. Uh, Roger Wendell, who I mentioned earlier, sometime, I think by December, he will have summited Mount Morrison a thousand times. So should we have a party for that? Because I was thinking about that the other day after the meeting that we had last month, a couple of weeks ago. I think we should be there like either at the top. I prefer the bottom and maybe because I'm not sure I even want to go up because you have to come down, right? Well, you have to come down. <laughs> it's ball bearing pebbles on yeah. hard dirt. I admit it. I'm a bit of a princess when it comes to trails. <laughs> and, well, I wouldn't be able to make it because I'll be in recovery and rehab from knee surgery in about a month. So, so maybe we should have a, a little welcome at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, we could very well do that. Somebody will have to pick me up because I can't drive for at least four weeks. But uh, up. there's just no screaming allowed when I drive. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So uh, just some general updates uh, for Denver Group Conservation. Uh, after having uh, about two and a half years of me and to a lesser extent, Phil Comer, kind of doing a lot of the work. Uh, we're recognizing the input from people like Shannon, also Dave Litke, Jim Guerra, and Michael McMahon, and we're expanding to a steering committee. And that's going to be running Denver Group Conservation. And I've kept you, Sandy, in the loop on this. Uh, we have a meeting coming up on November 3rd for the steering committee and other folks who have been active, very active, will be invited to that and hopefully we'll come up with some wording for uh, what the change in our charter will look like because that has to be approved both by council as well as by Julie as the conservation director. Uh, the other big announcement which most of you already know about is that Grover Cleveland stepped away as chair of the Denver Group Trails Committee at the end of June. Uh, it was an amicable parting, at least, uh, I mean, I helped him unload his tools. He was very friendly, but he hasn't responded to emails from anybody. And so I'm thinking he's probably done with the club for a while. I plan to email him right around the holidays in December just to say how you're doing and all that. Uh, the upshot from that is uh, we're probably going to bring trails in under conservation. Uh, Grover had somebody he thought lined up to take over, but that person, I guess, backed out. And um, we do have a vacancy, a vacant spot on the steering committee that we'll probably reserve for a trails person once we get some progress made. And uh, Julie and Kendall will both be helping with the uh, steering committee development 
and I'm hoping that Kendall can attend on November 3rd. Uh, Julie, maybe we'll have you by Zoom if you're not in town, or uh, you can toss it over, all over on Kendall. After all, she's the new person on the block. But anyway, I'll be getting some information out to people. And uh, Carol Bennett, who is active in Douglas County, wanted was kind of interested in the steering committee, but realized she didn't have time and wanted to know, well, how are you going to accommodate people like me? And I said, well, we're just going to call it the alternate group. And so we've got, got about another 10 to 15 people who have been very active that we want to keep on this list and make sure they have opportunities to weigh in on how this develop, develops. But I think it's going to be a team effort. Uh, one thing I'll be working on yet this week is I do have Grover's uh, list of emails. And uh, Grover was brilliant at what he did, but for the life of me, I can't figure out why his list is only email addresses and no names. <laughs> and uh, so I've been through it. Uh, some of the emails, I could identify the person because they're on the conservation list. A few of them had their person's name in like John Doe at gmail.com. So I know who that is. So I'm going to just do an update to these folks. Uh, there were no projects in 2020 because Forest Service canceled all their volunteer stuff on both Clear Creek and South Platte districts. And I don't think Grover did much of anything this year before he left. Uh, I mean, we still, of course, had COVID restrictions. So I'll be getting out an update to those folks, just letting them know that uh, we're still alive and kicking here. Uh, I think I think Joan took off. Yeah, she had, I think she had another Zoom, but evidently he had some awards system set up. So we're going to try to continue that. People getting patches if they had attended two or three different sessions. And the other thing, Sandy, just for your info, info particularly as well as others, uh, there are some identifiable trip leaders on there. So what I'm going to be doing is a separate note a second note to the people I can identify as trip leaders and just to see who's interested in continuing. And I also want to find out who is a VOC certified for leading trail crew, uh, VOC being Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado. Grover was VOC certified, I'm VOC certified, and uh, but and Julie, you haven't had a chance to weigh in on this yet, but maybe something to think about that as we move forward, maybe we should try to get our crew leaders in Denver as we move forward VOC certified. Now, that's not as bad as it sounds because about half or more of that training program is group dynamics and the like. And uh, people will get that in uh, CMC Leaders School. So it's not as onerous as it sounds, but that's something we talked about at the steering committee a little bit. I've shared some of those thoughts with uh, some of the other folks. And uh, so that's kind of where we're headed. And then for, and Julie, I'll give it back to you in just a moment. Uh, Julie and I have talked about a potential speaker for late January, early February. Uh, we're looking at Ray Rasker, PhD. Uh, he is an recreation economist with Headwaters Economics in uh, Montana. And uh, he's very good at his trade. I heard him talk in Montrose on a joint CMC Western Colorado Congress presentation about 1994, 95, some, somewhere around that area. And uh, this is probably something he'd jump at. The other person I had tossed over to Julie was John Loomis from Colorado State University. He, He's also a PhD economist in outdoor recreation, uh, but I think he's retired and we'd have to do some tracking. And uh, he was a CMC member at one time with the Fort Collins group, now Northern Colorado. So that's all I have. I'll turn it back over to Julie if you wanna toss in some things about what we're doing and then we can take one last round of questions and then we'll conclude for the evening. Great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I don't think I have um, anything in particular to add or excited to have um, kind of the Denver group steering committee get get up and running. And obviously, you all have been doing a ton of good work and, and hopefully this will help, um, 
yeah, disperse some of the, the workload amongst a, a larger group and, and also allow us to engage more members. I think that was a big part of the discussion that we had is how do we go from, you know, having this, this core group of, of folks who are at every meeting and, and working hard on different projects um, to, you know, bringing a, a bigger segment of the Denver group into conservation activities. So excited for that. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I have, Steve. Okay, any last thoughts from either Kendall or Sandy as our council liaison? Not right now, thanks, Steve. Thank you, Sandy, and we appreciate the job you've been doing uh, for us this year. And Kendall, I see you're still on mute, so you might be begging off from further comments. <laughs> I don't really have any further comments at this point. Um, I will be there November 3rd, so you can count on me there. Um, and I guess that's shameless plug for anyone who wants to come on November 3rd. I'll be there. You can meet me in person. And I don't know if I'm not much of a draw, but <laughs> thought I'd try. Well, I'll jazz it up when I put out the note to some of the other folks. Beyond the steering committee, I've got an immediate mailing list of about 40 to 45 people who have done at least something in the last couple of years. Uh, and, uh, and of course we have a bigger list and, oh, I almost forgot Elizabeth Morgan, who's on the steering committee is planning to do a survey of that larger list to see if, if we still have everybody and uh, see what they want. She's also been very helpful in leading us through a planning process called SWOT SWOT, which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So that's all I have, Julie. So if you want to go ahead and uh, close us down, we'll see you next time. Thank you all for coming. Great. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for your participation. We'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you all. Good night. Good night.